Hello there and welcome once again to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're glad you're with us. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today we meet the Democratic candidate for governor. Yes, uh, the Honorable uh, Jerry Askins, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma, is with us today. She's uh, kind enough to uh, give us time to talk about her candidacy for governor, what she's been doing, how it's been going. She's always uh, gracious to give us her time, and we really do appreciate it. And we had a similar show with Republican nominee Mary Fallon about a month ago. We did. This is balancing the scale so that uh, our viewers will have a chance individually to see each of the candidates for governor. And um, we uh, wish both candidates the best of luck. Jerry Askins. Today's uh, in interview E on the set of the verdict. We'll be right back. How do we create a better world of energy? The answer is obviously not foreign oil. Wind and solar need decades of development, and we've set the bar higher for the environment than coal can achieve. So the answer? American natural gas. It strengthens our economy, reduces pollution, and protects the environment. Learn more at chk.com. Chesapeake, America's champion of natural gas. see Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Go to saintsok.com and reserve your time online. Why didn't we think of that? Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. We are really pleased today to welcome back uh, an old friend to the verdict, uh, the Honorable Jerry Askins, the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Oklahoma and the uh, Democrat candidate for uh, uh, governor uh, here in Oklahoma. Uh, governor Atkins uh, did her undergraduate and law work at the University of Oklahoma. She has served in all three branches of government here in the state. She has been a judge. She has been a distinguished member of the House of Representatives where she was the first woman elected to uh, lead the Democratic uh, leadership uh, in the House. Uh, she is, was the first uh, woman elected chairman of the uh, Pardon and Parole Board. She was the first woman elected, uh, uh, first Democrat woman elected uh, lieutenant governor. And uh, we're really pleased you'd give us your time. I left out, and I didn't mean to, that she's also been inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame. Welcome Thanks. back. Thanks. It's always good to visit with you guys. Well, how's the campaign going? I think it's going really well. Um, this is after Labor Day. Things always seem to pick up a little faster. People begin to plug into the fact that the elections are about two months away, inside two months now. Uh, so they begin to get a little more interest. Uh, they've got their kids back in school. They've got their routines down. So now they're focusing on what else is happening around the state. Well, as you travel around the state and visit with voters, mm -hmm. what are they telling you? What are their issues? They're concerned about jobs. They're concerned about uh, their schools. They're concerned about, um, you know, a lot of these folks are going to take their kids to schools and they're finding uh, larger class sizes because uh, of budget cuts, there have been a reduction in the number of teachers and in, 
the ability to put more students in a classroom. So some of them are concerned about if this is a trend that's going to continue or if we're going to be able to kind of hold the line mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and not have to make more drastic changes like that. Well, as governor, what would you do to address those issues? Well, I, I really do think we have to change the way we do our budgeting process. And I, I've advocated uh, before, and I think it's even more important now, that we talk about uh, having a session where we do nothing but budget. I, I think you can come in this next session and make budget the priority and do the budget first, spend the first two months or whatever on budget and you don't have to pass any laws but let's get a budget done. But I'd like to see the legislature send to a vote of the people a constitutional change to allow a two-year budget cycle and one session that does nothing but budget and then the second session deal with substantive law. When you do that, what you do is you allow every legislator to be involved in the process, they make better decisions. They have more time to look in depth at where the spending is right now to be able to see and compare if there's duplication or repetition in services that are provided. Maybe we can, um, it gives you a smarter opportunity to make changes about where you're gonna spend your money. And I think that's what the people of Oklahoma want to see. Well, uh, the bodies that uh, deal with the budget, the, the House and the Senate, and of course ultimately the governor, are supposed to approach it as a deliberative process. Your suggestion might uh, facilitate it being more deliberative. Well, I think, uh, I think it needs to be. Uh, every member of the legislature who gets elected wants to do the right thing. I, I believe that. But a lot of them don't have an opportunity to be trained in the areas of appropriations until maybe just as they're leaving the legislature. If they, were, if they had a chance to focus on nothing but budget, and especially with a, a budget you know, crisis that we think we're going to have going into uh, the 2011 session, it would give every member of the legislature a chance to serve on a subcommittee, to look at specific agencies, to become more informed, which lets them answer questions of their constituents when they return home. And the more people have an opportunity to learn about what's going on, the better decisions they make. And I think that helps all of us who are ultimately responsible for the policies of the state. Let me ask you a question. I, I noticed with interest off your website, uh, was, uh, cheating a little bit on getting the show ready, uh, that you had a particular affinity for uh, uh, Jimmy Webb's uh, Oklahoma centennial song, Oklahoma Rising. What is it about that song and the words of that song that uh, touched you? Well, you know, I, I, I was so fortunate to be Lieutenant Governor during Oklahoma's centennial year. And I had the opportunity to hear that song over and over um, to the point that my staff would laugh and say, there's your song, because <laughs> I love the words. I thought it should be played so often in every school in Oklahoma that the children of Oklahoma learned those words as much as they do our state song, because it's called Oklahoma Rising. And that, to me, sends the message that Oklahoma is not where she's yet headed to be that we have finished our first 100 years, that we have more we can do, and it's more that will take us up, that will raise us up so that people know where Oklahoma is, what Oklahoma is about. When folks like the mayor and the mayor of Tulsa have an opportunity to be talking to business leaders across the country, they have a better concept of what Oklahoma is and what we can offer their businesses and their families. You list education as a priority of your campaign. Yeah. What would you do as, on education as governor? Well, the nice thing is we're going to also have not just a new governor, but a new state superintendent of public instruction. Gives me an opportunity with my appointments to the State Board of Education, as well as the Secretary of Education that I would appoint, to begin to craft policies that I hope move our educational focus not just to the student performance on a particular test, but the student's ability to transition into the workforce and be career ready whenever they conclude their formal education. Whether that is at the end of high school, we hope they'll choose uh, mm -hmm. college work, whether associate's degree or all the way through a bachelor's or, or a supplemental degree, or whether it's going through career tech and finding specific skill certifications that are required to meet many of the job requirements that we are recruiting to this state. So education is going to have to begin to change. Technology is beginning to make that happen. I think we begin to look at the curriculum that we have and see whether or not we are forcing curriculum to be offered at specific grade levels 
when instead maybe we should offer some things earlier, some things later, and, and make it more readily available to the student as they are prepared to learn, not something that we were, um, we were forced to do because that's the way we did it. Yeah. The budget is a pie. Would education get a larger share of the pie if you were governor? I, I don't know. I think that we need more money to get to the classroom, and so the opportunity of being able to focus solely on a budget for a session would let us really look at where the dollars are going right now through the State Department of Education and let us make sure that we're getting maximum dollars into our classroom. Technology gives us a chance to, and some schools are experimenting with using electronic books instead of the written textbooks. Whether that is a, a feasible is more likely in the future generations than certainly for us. Because uh, I like to hold a piece of paper and and you know be able to read it and and but the kids today don't don't learn that way so I think we have an opportunity to look at some things we could do maybe you save money in some areas and, and then are able to shift it uh, to the classroom. Where do you stand on health care issues both uh, in the state of Oklahoma and nationally? Well I, I believe in health care I think <laughs> you know when when I was running for lieutenant governor and visiting with some women business owners uh, in, a, in a setting I asked them what's the what's the biggest obstacle that you face as a new business owner I truly expected it to be government regulations or licensing and they said the inability to provide health insurance to our citizens that's why I actively supported the insure Oklahoma program that we have in our state and I think it's a good example of what Oklahoma can do when we're given the opportunity um, to take care of ourselves I have a real concern with the federal bill that came down because I don't think it was drafted with Oklahoma in mind. I don't think it had anything to do with our state. And although the ability to cover some pre-existing conditions and to have some transferability if you change jobs, our small businesses can't pay for it. If, if you look at where Oklahoma's economy is right now, our per capita income is, is still low. And so I don't know how we, how the federal government expects us to be able to have our businesses be able to pick up that insurance cost and be able to pay for some of the mandates that are coming down from Washington. Jerry Eskins is the Lieutenant Governor. She's running for Governor. We'll have more with Lieutenant Governor Jerry Eskins right after this. You're watching The Verdict. This can is called for all the grandfathers and I dedicate it to my grandfather, Franklin Allen. Me and him just had like a spiritual thing where I just learned lessons from him without him telling me anything. The three dots on the feather represent my immediate family. And as my grandfather told me about the Chickasaws, that family is the most important thing. To me, the eagle sees everything as our elders do, also representing my grandfather and his bravery in the Korean War. I actually just started on the wings for the eagles, and that's when my mother called and told me that he passed away. He took his journey. It's like somebody watching you when nobody's there. I guess he wanted me to finish it, so I finished it. He's been with me ever since. It shows how strong a Chickasaw family can be. The oil and natural gas industry helped provide a revenue that uh, feeds our schools, uh, providing a better education for not only my kids, but uh, for children all over the state. It will allow the schools to buy better equipment, we'll be able to hire qualified teachers, and all around to have a better educational experience. The future has never been brighter for our students here. We should be very proud of the oil and gas industry in Oklahoma. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We are interviewing Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins, and I'll remind our viewers that we had the other gubernatorial candidate, Mary Fallon, on the show recently, and so this is Governor Askins' uh, opportunity to, to uh, respond and tell about her candidacy. Let's talk about the energy industry. It's mm -hmm. certainly one of the, the critical elements of our state's economy. 
Absolutely, and I feel really fortunate to come from a background that has been heavily dependent upon our oil and gas industry. When I got out of law school, I practiced oil and gas law until I went on the bench. And so uh, from checking records for lease brokers to help pay my way through law school to doing division order title opinions, I, uh, um, I learned a lot about how the oil and gas industry made things possible for me that, that my family couldn't have provided on their own. So I'm very grateful for that. We have a great opportunity in our state, I think, to continue to be a leader as we move forward in developing what's the future energy plans going to be. If the, if the nation's capital isn't going to spend time coming up with an energy policy, I believe states can still hmm. do one on their own. And as Oklahoma has always been recognized as an energy leader, and I, I believe as Oklahoma governor, I want to be part of helping lead the states to develop energy policies that not just benefit us individually from an economic standpoint, but also help ensure the national defense. We can do things like ensure that the state uh, perhaps begins to move its state fleet to domestic resources, whether it is natural gas or whether it is, you know, in some instances there may be state vehicles uh, that could be electric that are um, um, maintenance vehicles in a particular location. We're beginning to see that at some of our state facilities. And as governor, I can set the standard and say this is our plan that by X number of years we're going to have moved our state fleet to be reliant upon domestic sources. And the more we can do that, the more we can focus on what we're able to produce here, whether it's oil, whether it's natural gas, whether it's uh, other kinds of energy that would perhaps be wind energy. I don't know if solar becomes a big player in Oklahoma, but I do believe wind power will continue to be. It gives us a chance to help develop our energy policy. It gives us more opportunities within the whole framework of our energy portfolio that removes our reliance upon foreign oil and foreign sources, and that is an issue of, of, of defense here in our country. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, you've used the word lead and leadership a couple of times in the course of your answers. What kind of leadership skills does the governor require to be uh, effective, and do you have those skills? Well, I would hope that a governor would have good listening skills. Um, the opportunity to hear from different people. I think that's why a governor organizes her cabinet in a way to bring different people together uh, that can have the ability of telling a governor what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. I had the opportunity of working for about 15 months as deputy counsel in a governor's office and I often um, you know, just kind of cut to the chase and, and told the governor what I thought he needed to know about a corrections issue or criminal justice matter, not what I thought uh, perhaps the public wanted to hear from him, but what he needed to know. I, I think being able to uh, bring people together and assimilate the information that you hear and able to make a decision is also critical for a governor. The governor is the chief executive officer. You do seek advice from others, but ultimately you are the decision maker mm -hmm. and you have to be willing to step up and to make those decisions. I would hope that my background as eight years as a judge, chairing the pardon and parole board, the 12 years in the legislature has proven that I have, a, have that kind of a background and have those skill sets that I think are really important during this economic downturn that we have and, and the next four years especially. If elected governor, you might be dealing with a Republican-led House and Senate. How would that work? I hope I could follow the example of Governor Bellman and the successes that he had as a Republican governor working with a Democratic legislature. I think uh, a lot of people consider him a great statesman, and I think that was because of his willingness to work hard to get things accomplished without worrying so much about who got the credit for it. I think that's a great example for us, and I think that uh, the fact that I have served in the House of Representatives with some of the members that are currently there, certainly with uh, Chris Steele, who is designated to be the next speaker, and the fact that I have served as president of the Senate the last four years, and some of those senators used to be in the House as well. I have a relationship with them. They know who I am. Many of them have my cell phone number. We're used to talking, and I think we would be able to have a great deal accomplished because we would all sit around the table like this from the very beginning and not wait till the end. 50 states, 
50 different state constitutions. Oklahoma has a specific role for its governor. How does it compare with what other states have and what are some of the misperceptions about the role of governor in the state of Oklahoma? Well, I think that's a really mm -hmm. great, great question because as the chief executive officer for the state, people assume that, that you really have a lot of power and a lot of control, but compared to some states, Oklahoma's uh, powers, we have a really strong legislative body and some cities might liken that to having a strong city manager and, and a weak mayor or a strong city council and, and, and a mayor not having as much uh, autonomy as one might think. A lot of the governor's ability to uh, guide policy in the state really stems from her ability to make appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, you don't replace them all at once. You usually they're staggered and so you begin to have an impact with those appointments and certainly then through the appropriation process. Even though the legislature presents the governor with a budget, uh, ideally you work together so that you make sure that you have a budget that gets signed that does not get stalled through a veto and so you have the opportunity to help um, shape priorities, whether it be investment in education, which I think is the workforce of the future, or whether it's continuing investment in our roads and bridges, mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to have influence that way. Okay. Uh, term limits. Uh, we're going to have a chance in November to vote on uh, a proposal that would uh, change the Constitution to impose term limits on some statewide offices. I guess most of the what some people have termed secondary statewide offices. I don't think of them as secondary, but in any event, what's your view about uh, term limits uh, on uh, statewide offices? Well, you know, I'm term limiting myself as, as Lieutenant Governor, choosing not to run for re-election and, and obviously running for an office that I know does contain a two-year, a two-term limit, an eight-year limit. Uh, so I, I, I think it's sometimes easy for people to think, well, some people have been there too long and we want to get them out. When you have someone that really is good in the office they have, I think you have the ability. I, I hate to lose the ability to continue someone that we think has done a great job. Likewise, I do know in legislative districts that sometimes people may be frustrated with their legislator and they may say, oh, well, they've only got one more term they can serve. Let's let them serve it and then, and then we can get somebody new. It, but for the term limit, they might have voted out someone that they thought was less effective. So I don't want us to get in a situation where we just say, oh, well, we'll just let them get by one more time. Um, I think the people can make that decision. Uh, I'm running for an office that's term limited, and I hope that people give me the chance to serve that. I have about 30 seconds for you to talk about redistricting, which will be coming around the corner. Well, I think that it's really important, and, and I happen to be in the legislature uh, the last time redistricting occurred, and so I'm really the one uh, running for governor that has that personal experience of having been there and having been involved with a legislature that was of a different majority than the governor at the time that redistricting occurred. We were able uh, in 2001, after the census was taken, to uh, work with Governor Henry and the bill that the, House of Rep that the House of Representatives and the State Senate passed relating to legislative districts was agreed upon and was signed by the governor because there was input from the beginning. It was also the time we were losing a congressional seat. You do redraw the, the congressional lines. We were not able to reach agreement and it ended up going to court. <coughs> Having been through that, I know the advantages of trying to figure out how to make it work, save the state some time and money. Governor, we'd like to offer you now a minute and a half or so just to look in the camera if you choose, but to talk to the, can to the voters of Oklahoma about why they should elect you. Well, I'm delighted to be here um, with the verdict and, and always enjoy the opportunity to visit with the two of you. You present great opportunities for us to reach people across the state of Oklahoma that we don't often have the chance to, uh, to communicate with. Most of you all know I'm from Duncan, Oklahoma. Uh, August of this year, I've owned my home there for 30 years and still have a chance to go home almost every Sunday for church. And when I'm there for church, I sing in my church choir and I always make sure you know that it's not because I'm a soloist, it's just they need my volume. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm there to add to the volume of the choir. But it's where I go because that's who I am and that's what I want to remember where I came from. To the people in my church, I'm just Jerry. A lot of those folks were my youth leaders and they still are in part of my life today. Uh, they remind me who I am, where I came from, and exactly why it is that I have a passion to serve the public of Oklahoma. I um, um, really want the opportunity to serve as your governor because I think Oklahoma is facing some tough times. We know 
that the budget is going to be uh, difficult again this year. We know the economy is beginning to look better, but it's not where it needs to be. Someone who's used to making difficult decisions on the behalf of the people of the state needs to be the chief executive officer and serving as your governor. I hope you'll give me that chance, and I look forward to visiting with you all again. Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins, candidate for governor. Jerry, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. And Kent and I will have a final word when we return on The Verdict. naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. Welcome back to the set of the verdict. We are wrapping up a show with Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins, who's the Democratic candidate for governor. And uh, remind everyone, we had uh, uh, U.S. Congresswoman uh, Mary Fallon on a previous show, so we've had both of the candidates on. And we'd love to get the two on together, and maybe that'll be able to, to take place, and maybe not. We have a web address for Jerry Askins, her candidacy. You can get more information at jerryaskins.com, and you can get more information about our website at theverdict.tv. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick. We'll see you next time. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.